Mr. Kessel. I would like to thank the panel. Um, I was just talking to a group of people from my home state and telling them the importance of what we're doing. Uh, that you know, this the procurement process is one that obviously that that goes to the uh, to the to the regular citizen is one. Why can't you solve it? You know what the issues are. Why can't you solve it? And I was just talking to them about. The, some of the uh, the complexities behind uh, the 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 notion of why can't you solve it, and and I was talking to him about how much I appreciate y'all coming in and, and the interest that you have in, in helping us to solve this and what it can mean to 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 our, our nation uh, to be able to have these savings to reinvest in another place. Uh, the question that that. I know you've been addressing, and I hate to ask you again, uh, but trying to get in my mind as we look to solve it. Uh, uh, that balance between is, is more of our issue, breaking that mindset of putting in a, 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 a cost that someone knows is not realistic, but it's been accepted for so long that they can get away with and add to later on versus how much where we ask for a, a, a systems of some type and then the requirements of that system and I heard someone mentioning as I, as, as I was going to meet another group of people uh, the requirements could be I think it was on the tanker where you might have 800 uh, options to be considered are, are we not defining the systems well enough? Just in, if anybody, whoever wants to jump on this one, you know, where, where in your opinion is the, the biggest challenge we have, that mindset that we can do anything in terms of adding costs, or the mindset that we're not defining well enough what we want? Well, Mr. Kissel, I'll, I'll start off. I think, um, to some extent, the requirements process uh, uh, is not well enough informed about our limitations of technology and cost. And I think there's the impression that if you write the requirement in great detail, you make it so. And I think that's where the disconnect is. So to some extent, the requirements, I think, get overly detailed to prescribe a solution and they aren't informed as to whether, in fact, those are achievable. And I think that gets, that's part of the problem right at the start. And then the cost estimate is no better than the information at the time. So if you're writing what I would consider to be relatively uninformed requirements in high detail, uh, you're, you don't have good enough cost estimates to challenge those requirements so you can proceed then, and then the end result is you get a lot more programs started through the requirements process than you can ever finish through the acquisition process. And if, and if that's the case, we've also talked about the lack of the, the, uh, uh, the persons in, in the Department of Defense to, to manage the projects anymore, that we've contracted that out. Uh, and to get that expertise back in, once again, whoever wants to go with this, uh, how long do you think that would take and where do we find those people? It's, it's a job that will actually never be finished in terms of, of how long it will take. It's an ongoing process. Um, I do think it's useful to recognize that this is a great time to be doing it. The economy works in our favor. Uh, as well as uh, as well as it ever will, um, there are three challenges really in in terms of that. One, this committee I think addresses uh, on some of the areas like cost estimating and systems engineering, both of which are, are critical uh, success factors to addressing the very question you raise: how do you how do you bring realism into your into your programs and into your budget? And by putting somebody at the top, you create a pull for that as a career field, and I think that's a, a, a very important factor to come into play. Um, people want to come to work for the government and do good work. They particularly want to come to work for national security because you're working on something that matters. And as we've looked at the, uh, at the, the individual 
people who make these decisions, there are two critical things. One is their first decision to come. The second is their decision to stay. And that's by far the harder part because it means you've got to give them something useful to do. You've got to give them the training. You've got to give them the real job. You bring smart people in and you give them nothing to do, they're going to stick around for no time at all. You can't legislate that, um, but you can fund it. And you can make sure that, in fact, the support is there for us. And one last point, and maybe more an observation than a question, is that we've got to also increase that mindset to reward the people that do that do, do well. And we had a hearing on that, and, and, and we know that it's very hard to quantify a system that, in effect, gives bonuses to people that do well, that the measurements there. I worked in a, in a, in a manufacturing uh, site for years where, you know, you got paid on what you did. And if you didn't do anything, you didn't get paid. And, and I know it's very hard to come up with that system in government, but uh, we've got to be able to have reward people in, other, in, in ways that, that if they see something not working and they let us know that they're not penalized. Uh, my office was trying to, and this is just one example, my office was trying to contact somebody on behalf of someone in our district that was interested in doing some contracting work for a DOD and the answer we got is uh, we, don't we don't do education, hire lobbyists. Uh, and, and that was just one example. So we've got to break that mindset and thank you Mr. Chairman for this opportunity. Thank you all for being here. Mr. Conway, the ranked member of the panel. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, appreciate uh, the panel being here today. Um, I'd like some comments on, on two things. One would be, uh, Mr. Francis, you mentioned a fixed time frame for programs that would have to live within, so to speak, in, in terms of, I guess, one of the requirements, because uh, it seems to me that the longer something takes, then the more temptations there are to add things to something that was not necessarily originally contemplated in the uh, uh, in the deal, um, and then also this uh, the differences between what the program managers are estimating programs to cost versus what the uh, the independent body does. I would prefer to see the the our bill uh, require a reconciliation of those two numbers. In other words, it, it seems to me that the decision makers ought to have access when they're deciding which numbers to use as to why there's a difference. And uh, your comments as to whether or not this bill uh, has enough teeth in it that uh, we can require the decision makers to know why there's a difference. They get to decide which way to go, but I think it would be helpful to know that, uh, that issue. And then maybe a third one if there's time, the idea that should there be a career path for in the uniform services uh, that, that puts a greater emphasis on requirements service so that uh, it's not just looked upon as a, a way station within my career. I got no upside. I, I've got to do it well. If I do it well, there's no benefit. But if I do it badly, my career is over kind of thing. So some sort of a comment on, a, on the uniform services having an uh, extended role within the requirements session, that requirements piece that would uh, uh, add to our uh, uh, knowledge base. Well, uh, Mr. Conway, I'll start with the, uh, <coughs> the, the time certain development or putting a bound on time uh, of time on uh, a program. I don't suggest that to be draconian in that. Gee, if you can't get the program done in this amount of time, it's not a program. But I think it's instructive to think about what is a reasonable period of time uh, for an acquisition to incentivize a couple of things. One is policy does prefer the uh, evolutionary approach, but practice seems to go to the revolutionary approach. So I think if we, we're talking about getting something done in five years, then it, it's going to create incentives for more evolutionary type approaches to acquisition. Uh, I also think part of the problem we're dealing with today is we're throwing some science and technology over the fence into acquisition, and programs become a good way to get big money to do some of the things you should have done earlier. I think if you put a limit there on what can be done after milestone B, you may actually then have to get some things done before then, and, and I don't know that that happens today. The third thing is accountability. It's very hard to hold people accountable for a project that extends 10 years. Something around five years, I think some of the people might still be around for that. Uh, Congressman, to your question on rec reconciling uh, the conflicting cost estimates, I do think the requirement in the House bill, as I understand it, the report that you asked the department render could be the vehicle for uh, 
coming forward to the Congress with that kind of reconciliation. I'd be careful not to be too precise because these things vary in terms of their specifics uh, each time. To the career path issue, I do think one interesting question is the issue of tenure of so program managers. Uh, I, I am one who is a fan that it would be useful to try to construct career paths so managers could serve from one milestone to the next. That means that they're responsible essentially for the outcomes <coughs> that they promised at the prior milestone. That would take some adjustment, uh, candidly, in how the promotion systems work in the military services because those intervals of time are quite long character and it's one of the reasons I think military departments are a little bit reluctant to allow someone to serve for that period of time. But I do think that is an issue worth, worth looking at. Congressman, on the independent cost analysis, I think the committee is exactly right on on that issue, and it's the resourcing on the independent side. If, if, if we can get those capable people, because this is, we have a slight disagreement among ourselves on whether the deputy secretary should adjudicate requirement differences with the Joint Chiefs or not, but on the reconciliation of the independent cost accounting versus service, that is a responsibility that the deputy secretary has. And um, generally the rule is is that uh, we divert from the, the CAG numbers in the deputy's office only with compelling analysis otherwise. And this is an irritant between the services and the deputy. But the, but the CAG is to be independent and removed in doing. In is, there, is there some history we can look at where uh, the CAG's is estimate has proved more accurate than the program managers? In other words, is there a, it, it, that irritant, is it uh, just because they don't like it or is it because the K gets it right or is it because K gets it wrong and they're right more often? Can we look at any kind of historical track record on that? Usually because it's vigorous and it makes people uncomfortable. Uh, rather than just anecdotally answering, I think that would be a great GAO um, issue just to look at, at the numbers. But my view would be historically, my first budget markup was in this room in 1977. So um, I've probably been through almost 35 rounds of this, but that those CAG numbers, particularly up front, tend to have, have more reality. On the acquisition uh, career management, there's an interesting thing. There is a unique, it's the Rickover Navy. The nuclear piece of the Navy has its own unique program management culture. Largely, you're taking most capable coming out of the academy in engineering, physics, things like that. And this special program office that the Navy has had has been an, an, an exceptionally capable system, largely manned by military personnel, <laughs> supplemented uh, by leading engineering, by some of the uh, FFRDCs. But it's, it's, it, it, the committee actually looked at it in the late 80s because it was an exceptional program system. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Whitman, Ms. Davis, Mr. Kaufman, in that order. Mr. Whitman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate, uh, appreciate the opportunity. I want to thank the members of the panel for joining us today. I want to thank the chairman, the ranking member, uh, Mr. Conaway and Mr. Andrews, for their efforts in putting together this bill. I think it's, uh, I think it's a great step. I wanted to get each of your opinions about the bill itself as it relates to decision-making. I think we all hear about where decision-making goes wrong, whether it's on the cost estimate side, whether it's on uh, operational testing and evaluation, uh, whether it's on the requirement side, systems engineering. We see at points that the system breaks down and we don't have good outcomes as far as decision-making. My question to each of you is, is, does this bill accomplish what you would like to see accomplished or what you think needs to be accomplished to make the decision-making process as good as it can be? And are there things that should be added or subtracted to the bill to get us to that point of, of that best scenario for decision-making? And, you know, the thought is, too, is to try to get us to a scenario where we have the best value coming out, out of the decision-making. So I'd like, like to get your thoughts and ideas on any additions or subtractions to the bill to get us to that point. I got elected. You were elected to. <laughs> um, uh, Mr. Whitman, a couple of things that uh, I can think about. Uh, one is I, I really do think uh, there could be some more specificity about the analytical rigor that can be brought to the JROC and JSIDS process. 
Uh, I think uh, right now the, uh, it's very difficult for that staff to actually do what they've been chartered to do. And uh, I think they can use some help in being able to broker and establish priorities uh, among programs. So I think, uh, I think some more could be done there. Um, I, I had mentioned earlier, I think the, it's going to be important uh, when we're dealing with the cost estimating to, uh, I think I'd like to see the, the uh, role of the keg preserved, but there does have to be some kind of um, um, a reconciliation process, I think, for cost. Uh, we've actually done some of the uh, analysis on cost, and you have a service estimate that's a number. The keg estimate is higher. But what actually goes into the budget is lower than the service number. So we already have some, some data, and I think, uh, I think that does need to be corrected. And the other thing I would think about, is there are a number of, I think, um, functions that the legislation calls for that do need to be uh, buttressed with resources, people, money, and time, and some specificity there might be useful. Congressman, I would add one thing uh, in terms of the, the bill's ability to help foster better decision making. Um, it's, it's often easy to avoid paying attention to issues as if they inconvenience where you'd like to go otherwise. And I think a number of the provisions of this bill make it more difficult uh, for those issues to be ignored in that process. Uh, and I think those are positive contributions. Congressman, as, as uh, I have commented, I think <coughs> the House bill uh, is careful to leave the specific organization secretary's office to the secretary's discretion. I think that's meritorious. Uh, I do want to underscore something uh, Mr. Francis said. It will be important that there are resources sufficient to these functions, and perhaps without being unduly intrusive or recommending micromanagement, uh, some encouragement in the report that you ask from the executive branch about, okay, what resources have been devoted to these functions, particularly relative to what was devoted earlier. In other words, has there been the added resource uh, effort that uh, I suspect is going to be necessary to carry out the functions that you've outlined might be helpful. Um, Congressman, this bill creates tools, and it will be as effective or ineffective only as the tools are utilized. And as I said early on, one of the things that made Goldwater Nichols so unique was the congressional commitment not only to creating the tools, but then to make sure that the tools were, were implemented and resourced. And so I think that will be, be the challenge, is to stay, stay on this topic. And then additionally, as, and this may be the first effort, I think at some point you may want to also just factor in how to think about O&M contracting, because that is becoming increasingly a larger seg segment and medical contracting a piece of that as well. But this creates usable tools to decision makers and then usable tools for the legislative branch to render oversight. Um, but it will require st sticking with it much in the same way that the committee's history of Goldwater Nichols was not just simply creating the tools, it was monitoring how those tools were be being used and that created a revolution. Gentlemen's time has expired. Thank you very much. The gentle lady from California, the chair of the personnel subcommittee, Ms. Davis, is recognized. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for being here. You've really been an excellent panel. And as you know, in addition um, uh, to um, the, the committee that's really looking at acquisition, the oversight and, uh, and investigation committee has also done that. And we focused a lot more, I think, on service contracts and even the culture uh, that has been created and, and perhaps the changes that really need to be made in that way to incentivize people to, to want to go into the field and stay in the field and, and bring the, the best, uh, get the best out of it. What I'd like to, to, to know is how, how some of the issues that we've looked at in terms of the service contracts really do have relevance in these much larger weapon systems contracts as well. And one thing that, that I think we haven't had a chance to really look at is the, you mentioned the track record um, that people have had. In service contracts, we know that folks have gotten contracts after they've performed very poorly. What do you see within the, the larger weapons contracts that is, is relevant in that regard? Is there a way of uh, looking at that in a, 
in a way that we actually can track it. It goes back to the accountability. I think that there are certainly performance incentives that you've spoken about. Maybe the carrots are better than the sticks, but can we track? Uh, not just the larger uh, contractors, and I want to talk a little bit about competition, but the subcontractors as well. Do, do even larger contractors know about subs who have performed poorly in some cases? How do we, how do we work with that information, and do you see a part of that in the bill that's already been addressed, or is that something that should be addressed in some other fashion? Um, on the um, on the contracts, I think in in the weapon systems area versus uh, service contracts, one of the things is we kind of know almost exactly how bad things are, and in services we don't. The data on services isn't very good at all, and I think over time uh, we've been letting service contracts uh, to bolster, let's say, our workforce, if you will, without really consciously deciding on where we want to be in terms of uh, service contracts, no normative vision there. Uh, I think in the weapon system area on contracts, um, one of the things uh, I had mentioned earlier is uh, we do use cost reimbursable contracts. They have a, uh, there's a place to use them and a place not to use them. And uh, where we're starting to use them where I think we have to really be careful is in production. When you're using a cost reimbursable contract in production, then to me that raises a flag that we really don't know what we're producing yet. Uh, the other area I think is using uh, award fees and, and we've done a number of reports on award fees now where what you describe is exactly what was happening that uh, contractors were getting pretty big award fees for not performing well. Uh, I think the issue of visibility into subcontractors is a key one. I don't know that the primes have good visibility, and it especially becomes a problem when you're doing systems of systems. So I think to the extent that uh, you can address a little bit more about uh, what goodness looks like, matching contracting instruments to, uh, to what is being acquired and protecting the government's interests, I think there's some things that could be addressed there. Mr. Bertrand, did you want to comment on that? I've spent a lot of time looking at the, the services contracts. Uh, we do a lot of analysis of that at CSIS, and I also was on the Gansler Commission looking at contracting in Iraq and Afghanistan. I think that for purposes of this bill, the focus is appropriately where it is now, and I think that uh, there's much that you can do as a committee in the services contracts area, but I would urge the committee to uh, save that for, uh, for subsequent legislation. Uh, even though there are some overlaps. Mm -hmm. and, and Mr. Bertrand, I know that you've mentioned, oh, well, go ahead, please, go ahead. So for many, many years, we regarded contracting um, and the people responsible for contracts as part of the tail. And I think what we found coming out of ongoing military operations is that the people that write O&M contracts are part of the team. And that if, if you don't have those people up front, you get some of the issues that you talked about poor execution, poor accountability, dollars squandered and unaccounted for. But it, we've got to change our mindset. The people, the civilians that do contracting, particularly battlefield contracting, are part of the team. I come from, I come from alligator country, and we know that alligators can kill with their tails just as effectively <laughs> as they can kill with their teeth. So. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen. The gentleman from Colorado, a very uh, uh, involved member of the panel, is recognized. Uh, Florida, excuse me. Mr. Kaufman's from Florida? <laughs> no, Colorado. I thought Mr. Chairman. So. Yeah, my Close. Gotcha. Recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. When we talk about uh, major wi weapons system uh, acquisition, it would seem to me that uh, we ask the contractors the defense contractors sometimes to, to develop uh, technologies that are not yet mature uh, to uh, not simply to produce a system but to develop a system. What would the world look like if we in fact truly bifurcated uh, those two uh, elements and then one was that we, we contracted for the development of a specific system to meet whatever requirements were laid down and separated that out from the production uh, of a system. 
Um, could you, uh, anybody speak to that? I think that's a very interesting idea, but it would require substantial revision to the uh, uh, U.S. government stand on how profits are uh, allowed. The current reality is the major profits in most contracts are in production, not in the development phase. And so what I think is very interesting about your idea is if you invite separate contract development without any and, and in fact, I think you almost have to go to the point of saying these will not necessarily be firms you're going to get the production contract because I think that is part of the current paradigm that does cause some of the dysfunctional behaviors that are uh, being uh, being uh, lamented. But it would take a ra major change in how the U.S. government thinks about uh, this function. One advantage, of course, is that you could encourage more designs if you were willing, and this comes back to just an issue that my fellow panelists have underscored, if you're willing to say no, no, we're only going to do one or maybe we're going to do zero of these, even if the development is successful. So that you separate development function from the production function in terms of how you think about weapons system procurement. But that would be a uh, truly revolutionary step in my judgment in terms of how the United States has typically done it. Mm -hmm. To the gentleman's question, you know, I think engineering it, it gives you technical data. So the engineer from the contract, the engineer from the government, the engineer from MIT, all are giving you data that you can then analyze. If you don't analyze it and force, force the trade-offs, then I think you're, you're missing an, uh, an opportunity. But we need to make sure that some of our most successful programs have been driven by the engineering rather than driven by budgets, thi things like that. The GPS system, that was, th that was a revolution. It was generated by the, the, the engineering of it. David Packard always, though, when he testified in 1986, was enamored with the AMRAM program because there, there was a competition between competing engineering houses. A winner was selected on the design, but then both of the engineering houses ended up producing part of it. And so it was an extremely competitive environment and it's an extremely successful program in terms of the a advanced air-to-air -air missile. Uh, I think it's still very much in the inventory and very much leading edge. Mr. Kaufman, I think you've hit on a, a, a very important issue that goes well beyond the scope of the bill but is worth the attention of the committee uh, for three reasons. One is, is of course, our, our past history is we rely upon technology advancement to sustain our defense uh, advantage worldwide and our national security advantage worldwide. Um, but what has, what has allowed that to happen is not only the, the model that Dr. Chu uh, described, there was in fact a, a world in which defense was a big driver on a lot of these technologies and we're now facing a future where defense is not the driver it once was. In fact, there are a whole lot of other elements of the economy that are bigger drivers, both within the U.S. and globally. Uh, we were also the driver at the technology edge globally, and there are some who still believe that 95 percent of all the important defense technology originates in the U.S. I do not count myself amongst those. I think we need to, to have a system that allows us to take better advantage of what's being developed elsewhere. Uh, and I think ultimately we have to ask ourselves the question, where is innovation going to come from? And, and how is defense going to take advantage of that when we're not the ones who pay for it? So I think you've raised some very, very critical issues there. Uh, Mr. Kaufman, a couple of thoughts. W one of the risks in separating, if you will, the system development phase from production is in the past we've had problems with the engineering in uh, the system phase not paying enough attention to production. And then when we went into production, you had to redo the design to make it producible. And I think uh, what we found in be uh, best pr industry practices is they're actually doing more teaming there and making, you know, b design build teams to bring that production discipline into the design process. Where I would think more about making the separation is between the technology development and the system development. Right now we're pushing technology into system and then we can't get the system development done right. So I would think more about making the, uh, the dichotomy right there. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you very much, Mr. Kaufman. The chairs, please recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania who's made a very important contribution to this bill in the area of uh, bringing out confidence uh, points in the estimates. Or Mr. Sestak for five minutes. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. And, and actually, that was going to be my first question. Uh, Mr. DeLeon, you have the um, ability to be over here and to be over there. 
across the river. Um, the aircraft carrier, uh, which is in the budget of the fit up, is going to cost something about $13 billion. The internal confidence factor of the Navy, which is not provided over here, is about 37 percent. The other day when the littoral combat ship was told it wasn't going to cost $250 billion, but $460 billion, when asked what the internal confidence factor was, they said about 50 percent. Now, you can get that information if you get a letter signed by the chairman, uh, not this young one. Uh, but the point here is, don't you think that in this transparency and as we're dealing with this issue, it would be good for us to receive the confidence factors of the costing that we are about to appropriate national treasury and so we don't come back and beat you up of, what do you mean it's going to cost more? Well, you, I told you 50 percent confidence. What do you think? I think that's absolutely right. And in fact, the GAO, as a tool of the House Armed Services Committee, has played a historic role. I read the study. Of course, you did. As a matter of fact, thank you. That's what led me into this. The second question I have, Dr. Chu, um, because I was taken also with Mr. De, De Leon said, force the trade offs. Uh, when then Senator Nunn, who wasn't even a member of the SASC committee, stepped onto the House floor and said, let's start having us know when you break thresholds. And he said, which became the Nunn McCurdy threshold. We've had 30 programs since January 2006 break Nunn McCurdy. It's a wonderful monitoring system, but there's no teeth. All of them got approved, and yep, that's great. Continue on. What do you think about forcing the trade offs that when you have a significant break, that you come back? And you say, look, here's what the real cost is, and here's the confidence factor on it. It's about 80, 85 percent. And if you go to, if we go to the um, critical break, you know, the 15 percent more, here's where we'll trade it off. In other words, forcing the trade-offs. I thought Mr. DeLeon had a very key point there. I'm kind of talking about a Nunn McCurdy on steroids. Congressman, I'm told that the recent revisions to Nunn McCurdy have made it more effective in the direction that you. Uh, no, sir, not this way. Uh, I've read both bills. Uh, no, I'm not speaking to the bill here, uh, but but uh, changes think. in the last several years to Nunn McCurdy uh, are alleged by some. I'm not uh, expert on uh, the recent developments uh, to have improved that process. I, I think the real trade-off problem, however, is not Nunn McCurdy per se. Nunn McCurdy does require. Secretary to certify, as you know, if there's a break that he's going to continue the program. Why is that going to be true? Uh, the real trade off problem is I inside the department, and th the same thing happens here in the Congress, as, as I, I know you would acknowledge. If you're going to recognize a higher estimate for System A against a fixed top line, that means someone else has to give up resources. And that's why the tension that Mr. Dion described occurs when the intended cost benefit comes forward, not because the estimators are unpleasant people, because they are raising an issue of, at the highest level of the department, sacrificing some other objective in order to make this program right. And that's always a very painful decision. Everyone is enthused about the wisdom of the higher estimate, it means more, uh, uh, more likely to predict correctly the costs. The real tension, the real trade off, in my judgment, is. What do you have to give up within a fixed set of resources in order to sustain that higher priority program? Y if I might, yes, and sir. sir, I had four questions. If I could, I have a second round if I don't finish these four after everybody else. We'd have to consult with the minority about that. I think I can speak for our side. That's fine. <laughs> Great. We, we are. I know Mr. Taylor is also going to have a second round. So yes, mm -hmm. I understand that. But if you take that as a given, this tyranny of optimism that's inherent in the Pentagon with defense industry. However, th does that then say, but none McCurdy doesn't matter, why bother to tell you about it? Sh in other words, just to go down to another level, having made that decision right. there, should we then have more than a monitoring system, but one that continues to force trade-offs, which they don't presently do? You'd like to get that at the beginning, but shouldn't we continue that throughout? I, I'm not arguing against your point, sir. I, I think I'm offering a different observation. I think the real problem when it comes to recognizing uh, these issues in the, 
the budget specifically of the bu bu president's budget request is that to do so requires some other objective be sacrificed and that's where the tension arises so yes there's the optimism out there all those problems but in the end the, it's not as if people don't know they are taking risks, they know that. The question is where they want to take those risks. And I, I agree. I think you've hit it right on the head. And I just didn't know if you still had to force those trade-offs later on. Could I ask you a question, sir? Jay Rock, um, I was quite taken, and I've told Mr. Andrews, that after Goldwater Nichols was passed and the chairman walked into the tank that day, the other four members of the Joint Chiefs of Staff stood up for the first time. He was now not one of equals, he was the decision maker. I've watched J-Rock evolve. That was operations. It's not procurement. And J-Rock over the years, as you were over there, seemed to get a little bit of OSD into it on the lower levels. You might even sit at J-Rock today. Uh, but I've been quite taken that it's not dissimilar, in my opinion, than the Joint Chiefs of Staff were pre-Goldwater Nichols. I've got my program, you've got yours. Mm, why don't we kind of agree how we're going to do them both? Mm, it kind of gets to the tension question here. Should legislation, Goldwater Nichols too, be brought about to say, well, wait a minute, the chairman, who really is in charge of the JROC, by the way, even though the vice chairman sits there, should be the decider of the tension of the trade-offs rather than the committee? Uh, Mr. Sestak, I don't know that um, legislation just to make the chairman the decider um, is going to change the status quo much. I think our analysis shows that the, the joint staff is basically overwhelmed with the amount of volume that comes in, and they simply don't have either the people or the analytical tools to come in and look at uh, what the priorities are or what trade-offs are necessary. So a, a new chairman with that power would still be limited by the abilities of his staff. At the same time, most of the requirements coming in are still service-centric. So I think, I think we'd have to do more to get at, at those kinds of problems. Thank the gentleman. Uh, we'll go to a quick second round, uh, Mr. Taylor. Anyone else that, uh, that has additional questions, we'll go to them, but Mr. Taylor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and I appreciate you gentlemen sticking around this long. Going back to Mr. Berto's uh, comments on the thousands of pages of requirements, when I think we correctly went back to having the LCS made with military specs rather than civilian specs, and this is a military craft. But to your point, my impression is that the people at the superintendent of shipbuilding are very good at looking at, at a set of specs, looking at what the contractor's doing, but really aren't qualified enough to say, you know what, there's a better way to get to this place. They're pretty good at seeing that the specs being made. I don't think they have enough expertise to say, you know what, another yard is doing this quicker, better, faster by acquiring this piece of machinery. If you think about it, Guys like Admiral Sestak had many years of training to become ship drivers. Captain Evans to become a submarine captain, et cetera, et cetera. What I sense we're lacking within the military is a dedicated career path with the adequate training to become acquisition experts. And, and, and again, given the vast variety of your expertise, the, you four gentlemen, if you think I'm wrong, tell me so. If you think we're on to something, I, I would like to know that. Second thing is, when I visit Walter Reed, as all of us do, I encounter a, a, a lot of people who want to stay in uniform. And they realize they've lost an arm, a leg, their hearing's not what it was, their eyes aren't what they were, but they want to stay on the team. Should we be making a greater effort as a nation to take some of those folks who are no longer going to be special forces qualified or no longer fl flight qualified or no longer infantry qualified and offering them the option of pursuing a career in the military as an ac acquisition expert, which I think you can be trained to become. So it's, it's a two-part question, and I'd, I'd welcome your thoughts on it. If I may, Congressman, on the second part, 
uh, in my judgment, the military services uh, are forging a new path in this regard and have been quite open to continued service in a different specialty, not necessarily acquisition per se. But, but, but have, have they pushed acquisition as one of those options, Dr. Chu? Because I would think that uh, that would be a natural. That certainly could be one of them, but they have, they have, in my judgment, opened the door on a whole wide range of possibilities for people, and so you do have individuals doing all sorts of things, including one officer who lost his eyesight teaching at West Point, for example, that's an extreme case, but right. we've had individuals, as you know, in fact, one individual returned to combat with a prosthetic uh, leg. So I do think military services have grasped the spirit of your second, uh, second challenge. On the first, whether it's adequate or not is, an, is obviously a judgmental issue, but uh, thanks importantly, I think, to direction from the Congress, the Department of the last 20, 30 years has invested a lot in Defense Acquisition University, in the notion of an acquisition career professional and what that certification might entail. So I do think there is a, uh, both for civilians and military, a good set of tools, once again, to- So, so help me out. I know, the, for example, the nuclear schools at Charleston. Where do we train people to be an acquisition expert? R right, a, a good, not exclusively, but a good deal of it goes on right down the road here at Fort Belvoir at, okay. Belvoir at Defense Acquisition University, formerly Defense System Management College. And there is a well-worked out curriculum, a set of standards in terms of certification. You get various levels of certification depending upon the training that you've received. Now, whether it's enough is another issue. Mr. Taylor, um, we spent a lot of time looking at this on the Gansler Commission from the narrower set of just contracting on career fields, not, ju not overall uh, program management and acquisition. And we found that uh, there had been a dramatic lessening of both the number of military who were pursuing that career and the opportunities to those military for promotions. Uh, in fact, the, the general officer billets have essentially disappeared. We went from about 20 um, 18 years ago to one last year. Now, some of that is being reversed in large part due to some intervention uh, by the Congress. On the broader uh, career field for, for program management and acquisition, um, there's still an awful lot of dynamics at work that uh, does not make it the most attractive career field for military promotions. It, it is not a warfighter field. I think the, the uh, proposition that you put on the table of warfighters who no longer can be warfighters is not a bad one to look at. Um, but uh, it's, a, it's a tough game to start late in your career and become the level of expertise that you need to have. Uh, the nuclear, I think, is a perfect example. Mr. De Leon brought it up earlier. You've got to build that in from, from the 01, 02 level if you really want to have uh, flag rank who are, who are capable of really managing the complexities that we have out there today. But Mr. Taylor, Taylor, you're asking one of those core questions where the more we delve into it, the more we sort of are striving to actually get to truth here. Most of the schools that focus on program management are focused on the business side of that, um, acquisition policies, things like that. And when the members broke for the vote, we sort of caucused here and we talked about the electromagnetic propulsion as contrasted to steam-generated catapults. And so when do you know that you're ready to take a jump in technology that will actually help the warfighter versus when are you pushing technology simply because your technical and scientific world says you can do it differently and you can do it fancier. Um, and so that kind of trade-off doesn't get caught, doesn't get taught in, in, in the schools but that was actually an excellent example, and we caucused and talked about it because we all have different views on it, sort of, but that's, that's going to drive costs tremendously. And so is there a flaw in the, in the current system that says we've got to change the technology? Will the, if we go to the advanced technology, will it be a game changer? Um, but the, as we school people on the program management side, we don't really focus on the engineering and, and the technical, and I think one of the tools your bill creates um, would be, and the, the testimony of uh, our former colleagues, Paul Kaminsky and Dr. Gansler, really focusing on this technical piece, not that the government's gonna be designing these systems, but that the, so that the government can adequately get into the middle of the trade-offs on, on the engineering side. So, 
um, long-winded, but our schools really focus on business side issues. And at the core of some of these critical decisions are, are engineering and technical rather than, 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 than business and budget. And so we've got to acknowledge that and, and factor that into the tools that we have. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Sestak has additional questions. Um, thank you, sir. I just have two. Um, Dr. Chu, I think you're right about this, <coughs> having to look at this um, tension at the beginning, or let me just phrase it that way. And, and I'd like to ask that question. But first, another one. Back when Alan Antovin established, you weren't born then. Only yesterday. <laughs> um, what became PA&E, and the keg was born, the costing office, and no other service had a costing office in the 60s. Now you got a couple people there, and you mentioned worried they don't have the resources, joint staff. This bill talks about having a person bless the cost from the services. How can he? If the keg, which traditionally is almost always right, even they suboptimize the cost. If he doesn't have the resources and the independent assessment of what the services under this tyranny of optimism give him, don't you really have to take it the whole next step and have an independent office which comes to Congress as the cost? I wouldn't recommend a separate office that with dual reporting responsibility. I think that's not uh, uh, going to work well over the long term. I do think you raise a critical point I, I touched very briefly on earlier, which is does the CAG and do the service independent cost functions have adequate staff to carry out what's expected in this statute? And I do think uh, encouraging some reporting on that point in the report the bill asked for would be uh, meritorious without being unduly intrusive. Uh, it is the case, apparently, that the costing staffs were cut back as part of the general reductions in the 1990s. And it's not clear, therefore, that the uh, cost staff numbers but today. If, if I might, just because of time, I think it's a great point. But if there's no teeth in them, it's nice for them to make an assessment. Shouldn't, shouldn't that, since they're almost always, every time, much better, more realistic? And you know studies have been done on this. Why don't we just take their cost? Uh, that, that is obviously the Congress's privilege. <laughs> <laughs> Could I ask a second question? Because I think you hit it on the head, actually. No, uh, this, you have something called the JROC, the Joint Requirements Oversight Committee. That's where this inherent tension should be decided. It shouldn't be decided by a committee, but it needs to be decided at the very beginning. How do you, I mean, I honestly believe that the unfinished business of Goldwater Nichols won, which was tremendous, but the unfinished business was PBAD, sitting down there in J8, a little budget office, and then under JSIDS, and Haas Co General Cartwright, when he was the three-star there, created that wonderful modeling and the JSIDS process and all the analysis that gives you the inherent tension gets to the JROC. That's the decision point. How can we, unless we change JROC like we did the Joint Chiefs of Staff, ever get, and Mr. De Leon, if you'd comment on it too, truly joint requirement that resolves up front the inherent tensions between my requirement and my requirement. And that's what Goldwater Nichols One did on the operational side. And everything is resident in JSIDS, sitting in J8, with OSD participating to resolve it at JROC. Either comments, both of you? start peeling back the layers, you get to the ground truth. After Goldwater Nichols, the prime focus was changing the way we did military operations, because that was the most pressing. Can you speak up closer, sir? Thank you. After we approved Goldwater Nichols, the most pressing was to make the changes in how we did military operations, stressing jointness. 
Now, where the JROC had success was really uh, in creating that joint, uh, that joint environment. So it was a command and control structure that all of the services could use. It was the integrating tools that would integrate air, uh, land, sea, space. Um, and I remember walking into a DRB meeting, the Defense Resources Board, where not the acquisition decisions, but the budget decisions are made. And um, the, the services are grumbling about the large C3I bill uh, at the s and the Intel bill, because those are areas where the JROC has had an impact and were very definitive in terms of integrating forces in the joint com com combat arena. And so there would be grumbling from the services about the expense of these systems, but then you'd ask, well, give us a show of hands who don't believe these are the budget priorities, and those hands would, would never appear. So where the JROC did do its job very well was creating the integration of the joint in environment uh, from a technology point of view. Um, where the JROC probably needs to go to a new phase to the second Goldwater Nichols, which is an appropriate description of it, is, is how to get to the joint environment on, on the prime warfighting tools that are unique to the services and to force those, those trade-offs. And then back to Mr. Taylor's issue, to have that discussion up front is a, and I don't know the answer, is a steam generated catapult sufficient or do you need to have an electromagnetic generated catapult system? It's gonna be a cost driver, it's gonna have operational ef effective issues, but forcing that kind of thing into a JROC environment up, up front. I thank the gentleman and a special thanks uh, to our panel for this excellent uh, testimony and advice. We, uh, we go from here, we will mark this bill up on, uh, the House bill up on uh, May the 7th, and we look forward to that moment, to that 